Buonasera a tutti, welcome to the Italian Cultural Institute. Um, my job is a beautiful job, and I'm always happy in doing it, except when I have to fill all those bureaucratic papers. But an evening like this is something special for me, and I work hard to make it possible. And here we are. Uh, today, our series about exile and creativity is coming to an end after a year of, ev of events. And I can't imagine a better conclusion than this, a conversation among two of the most renowned historians of our time, so Friedlander and Carlo Ginzburg. I'm very proud and honored to have them here not only because of their scholarships, Carlo Gimbusgur was the first to open the field of microhistory, and he's, he's best known for the formaggio e vermi, the cheese and the worms, and Solfried Lander is considered one of the worst premier historians in the field of the Holocaust, and the author of Nazi, German, and the Jews, that has transformed our understanding of this period. But I said, not only because of the scholarship, but also for their personal stories, as Carlo Ginzburg is the son of Leone, a victim of the fascist regime, and as many of you know, Solfried Lander's parents, who were born in Czechoslovakia, were killed in extermination camp, and he survived hidden in a Catholic boarding school in France. But I don't want to add any other word since you all are here tonight, like me, not to listen to what I could say, but to listen to them. So please welcome Solfried Lender and Carlo Ginsburg. start, I will skip 10 minutes, and then Shaul will start and uh, will uh, speak about 10 minutes, and then our conversation will begin. The topic of this encounter, exile and creativity, has deep personal implications for me. I will focus on them in a brief introduction. Then, during the conversation with my friend uh, Shaul Friedlander, something different, more general, will emerge. Let me start with a few biographical facts concerning my father, Leone Ginsburg. He was born in Odessa in 1909. His family moved to Berlin, then to Torino, Italy. He became an Italian citizen in 1931. In 1933, he began to teach Russian literature at the University of Torino. But in 1934, having refi refused to swear the oath of allegiance to the fascist regime, his academic career was over. In the same year, he was arrested for anti-fascist activity, he was a member of the underground group Justizia e Libertà, and spent two years in jail. Then he worked intensively for the Einaudi Publishing House he had co-founded in 1933. In 1938, due to the race laws introduced by the fascist regime, my father was stripped of his Italian citizenship. In 1940, he was sent to internal exile. The bureaucratic label was Internato Civile di Guerra, to a small village in the Abruzzi region. My mother with two children, my brother and myself, joined him there. My sister was born in L'Aquila. In July 1943, when the fascist regime collapsed, my father went to Rome where, under the Nazi occupation, 
He was the director of an underground anti-fascist newspaper, l'Italia Libera. In November 1943, he was arrested and his true identity was recognized. He was transferred to the section of the Roman prison controlled by the Germans where he was tortured. He died in prison on February 5, 1944. A few months later, Rome having been liberated, my mother, Natalia Ginzburg, who later become, became one of the most prominent Italian novelists, wrote an essay entitled Inverno in Abruzzo, Winter in the Abruzzi. I will read you a short extract from it, first in Italian, then in a recent English translation. And I think you may see the text over there. Quando la prima neve cominciava a scendere, una lenta tristezza si impadroniva di noi. Era un esilio il nostro. La nostra città era lontana e lontani erano i libri, gli amici, le vicende varie e mutevoli di una vera esistenza. Accendevamo la nostra stufa verde col lungo tubo che attraversava il soffitto. Ci si riuniva tutti nella stanza dove c'era la stufa e lì si cucinava e si mangiava mio marito scriveva al grande tavolo ovale, i bambini cospargevano di giocattoli il pavimento. Sul soffitto della stanza era dipinta un'aquila e io guardavo l'aquila e pensavo che quello era l'esilio. L'esilio era l'aquila, era la stufa verde che ronzava, era la vasta e silenziosa campagna e l'immobile neve. Now the same passage in Dick Davis' English translation. I quote. When the first snows began to fall, a quiet sadness took hold of us. We were in exile. Our city was a long way off, and so were books, friends, the various desultory events of a real existence. We lit our green stove with its long chimney that went through the ceiling. We gathered together in the room with the stove. There we cooked and ate. My husband wrote at the big oval table the children covered the floor with toys. There was an eagle painted on the ceiling of the room, and I used to look at the eagle and think that was exile. Exile was the eagle, the murmur of the green stove, the vast silent countryside, and the motionless snow." End of quote. My mother's unwilling immersion in a local, deeply provincial society had a deep, the provincializing impact on her writing. It was for her the revelation of a different world. Inverno in Abruzzo is a personal, poignant memoir which shows how her initially ambivalent attitude turned into painful nostalgia. In 1945, she provided a dense description, both imaginative and sociological, of the social environment in which she had spent three years. In 1952, she reworked her experience in a fictional perspective in a novel, Tutti i nostri ieri, All Our Yesterdays. As I argued many years ago, my own approach to history may have been affected by my parents' internal exile. My decision while I was a student to work on witchcraft trials had many fold roots, but one of them was perhaps my early exposure not only to the werewolf fairy tales that my parents used to read to me, but also to macabre stories which were sung in the village where we lived. In Inverno in Abruzzo, my mother recorded one of them. Uh, I wonder whether I can have the next uh, slide. Quote, Crocetta was our serving woman. Actually, she was not a woman at all because she was only 14 years old. She came to work for us and tell our children long stories about death and cemeteries. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a little boy whose mother had died. His father chose an another wife, and this stepmother didn't love the little boy. So she killed him when his father was out in the fields, and she boiled him <laughs> in a stew. His father came home for supper, but after he had finished eating, the bones that were left on the plate started to sing. Mommy, with an angry frown, popped me in the cooking pot. When it was done and piping hot, 
greedy daddy gulped me down. Then the father killed his wife with a sight and he hung her from a nail in front of the door. Sometimes I find myself humming the words of the song in the story. And then the whole country is in front of me again, together with a particular atmosphere of its seasons, its yellow gusting wind and the sound of its bells. Here is the original song in the local dialect, the only dialect I ever spoke in my life when I was a child. E la mia trista matrea mi ci ha cotto in caldarea e lo mio padre ghiottò mi ci ha fatto un bravo bocco. Sixty years later I met Crocetta, a moving encounter. In the meantime, the songs she would sing to me when I was a child had left their mark, affecting, I guess, my own work. This was wonderful. I... <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, um, Carlo uh, was kind enough uh, two, three years ago to give a, a quote, a blurb for one for my latest book, I think. And uh, there he said, if I remember now correctly, you think that you know somebody and then suddenly you don't know him. Well, that's what I can say about Carlo tonight. I mean, I know him for years, but what he said touched me deeply and uh, thank you. I, I discover uh, Carlo Plus. <laughs> um, I um, wanted to, to extrapolate a little bit on our topic. Um, I have the feeling, of course, much of the exile literature is straightforward and there are no questions. Is of internal, internal exile or foreign exile. But uh, in some authors, you find a strange opposition between uh, the political choice or the political necessity of being exiled, let's say for external exile, and a kind of cultural dependence on the old world from where you come. The two things clash in a way, and if you add to it personal motivations, then it becomes a, a kind of interaction of three factors at least in what the literature then will express. The literature of those writers I will mention now uh, in, expresses in different ways the interaction of those three factors, uh, and I will say that very quickly, of course. Um, let me take the first example, Thomas Mann. Uh, exiled, a kind of golden exile when he arrived in <coughs> our city, uh, Los Angeles, but still exiled. And that's where he wrote, as you know, the book trying to understand why what was the madness that sent him to Los Angeles, of all places, well, Princeton and then Los And if you read it, if you read it, you discover that, of course, nobody has doubts about Thomas Mann's political choice or political necessity to leave Germany. But when you read Dr. Faustus, you discover that he was so attached to the culture of his, his previous culture that he took all the prejudices and all the paradoxes of the old German culture with him. So that you have a kind of clash. He speaks of, of his political choices, uh, but basically he, re <coughs> he reaffirms without maybe noticing it, but I think he didn't know what he was doing, uh, his anti-Jewish animus uh, in Cunegon de Rosenstiel and in the impresario soul something, and mainly uh, his 
description of somebody he calls Chaim Breisach, uh, who is a totalitarian Jew. Uh, he existed, Chaim Breisach, in Munich under the name Oskar Goldberg. But Thomas Mann makes him a devilish figure, which he already described in NAFTA in uh, mm. the Magic Mountain. Mm. That is, one sees that uh, the big themes of Thomas Mann go over 20 years and more. And actually, the basic theme of Dr. Faustus' G uh, sickness and genius, the link between sickness and genius, brings us back actually to this in, in Venice and of course to the Magic Mountain and uh, to Dr. Faustus. So you see that if you read Thomas Mann against the grain, that is against his political choices, you find the old Thomas Mann with all the prejudices of old times. Now, let me say just one word about Han Aren. I don't want here to go into details, of course, we may have a discussion later on. She wrote, the, she finished her dissertation on Rachel Warnhagen in exile. She was in Paris and then came to New York, uh, but she was already in exile and she wrote the book about the ideal of, of an assimilation to German culture. That is, her ideal was Rachel Warnhagen, who became Protestant, but never mind, a German Jewess, who had a salon and had uh, the best people in Germany at the time coming as her guests. Now, this is really Hannah Arendt's, I think, dream of assimilation written in exile. You see, she left Germany, but she dreams of uh, coming back, in a sense, to a society which has rejected her. I don't want to go into the relation with Heidegger and so on, but you see in Hannah Arendt also contradictory tendencies. Now, there, there is internal exile, and here I know there is straightforward position. But if you take Hans Fader, for example, you know or don't know that under the regime which he rejected, he wrote a pro -Nazi, well, pro Nazi. He was convinced by Goebbels to write. He was very famous. Little Man, What Now? It was his novel of 1932 about the big depression. And uh, so he was known all over Germany, all over Europe. And he wrote. <coughs> Uh, the Eisele Gusta, which is a kind of pro-Nazi novel, but he started, and that is always passed very quickly about, uh, in his biography uh, on the two major scandals on the Weimar, the Barmat affair and the Sklarek affair, two Jewish uh, financial scandals, and he was writing it when the war ended. He ended in a Asylum, as you know, uh, of mental illness, but then after the war, he wrote this magnificent book uh, where he shows his anti Nazism. But that was after the war, uh, each man dies for himself alone. Now, let me go to something which will be the question to you, to everybody, to Carlo, who spoke about it very briefly today, and that is Ignacio Silone. After all, Silone, I mean, I read as a young man, I read uh, from Tamara, I read Pano Ivri, Evino. These were anti fascist novels. But Silone, at the same time, was a fascist uh, spy in a way. He was in Switzerland, but uh, in, in a very uh, nice exile, actually. Um, but he was in exile and wrote exile literature. But he himself was a fascist spy until, uh, until 40, when was his brother killed? Yeah. 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 Whenever, yeah. in the early 30s, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then he worked for the CIA and so on. So if you read Fontana, and if you read Pano Ivino, where, where does that come out in the 
literature, that he wrote. I mean, for the others, it's pretty obvious. We can go much deeper with Thomas Mann and Arendt, and uh, even with Hans Falada. But for Silone, and that really concerns many of you, because Italian literature, after all, I, I cannot understand where it shows in the literature. And our topic is exile, and of course, implicitly, its impact on the literature of those who write in exile. Or... So I will leave that question open uh, for further discussion. Okay. Yeah. I was <laughs> I was expecting something challenging, but I mean that there was something even unexpected. But this is part of our ongoing conversations. I mean uh, uh, which last that have been lasting for years and years. Okay. So I mean I would start with a sort of a distinction between uh, ambivalence and as a topic and ambivalence as a framework. You, yeah, in other words, uh, you selected, uh, uh, let's say, uh, three examples or four examples uh, in which ambivalence is, uh, let's say... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, in which ambivalence is, at the same time, let's say, a topic and also a framework. And, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in other examples, uh, which you didn't mention, maybe ambivalence is not a topic, but maybe, and this was, uh, let's say, the most challenging element in your presentation, there is some ambivalence which is related to exile, even when ambivalence is not a topic. So those examples are, for instance, Silone is an extreme case, very disturbing, very tragic, disturbing example. But even less, uh, less tragic, uh, extreme examples, of exile would imply some ambivalence, which is related to a tension, this is my interpretation of your comment, between, uh, let's say, the filter, which is uh, partially related to the original background, and the new reality. Let's call it cultural dependency and political choice, okay? Uh, okay. Let's, uh, I mean, I'm not completely convinced, but uh, let's accept this. And then I would like to uh, make a comment which is related to your own work. Um, this is uh, um, a quote from uh, a book uh, which came out in uh, uh, French, Réflexion sur le nazisme, a book by uh, Shaul, uh, Entretien avec Stéphane Bou, published in 2016. And uh, uh, it's a remarkable, remarkable book, very dense and provocative. And um, uh, you say uh, about uh, the first uh, volume of your autobiography, Quand vient le souvenir. By the way, this was translated into Italian by my mother. Uh, I can tell you how. Uh, I was in Geneva. We, we, I haven't met uh, Shaul. Uh, before. Later on, we became colleagues at UCLA. But uh, I was in Geneva, and uh, at the railway station, I bought a copy of his uh, uh, autobiography. At that time, uh, I mean, I was traveling by train, and uh, I couldn't sleep. I read the book all, all, all over the night, and uh, I came to Rome. I gave the book to my mother that said, this is absolutely extraordinary. She read the book and she decided to translate it into Italian. Now, you, are, uh, you commented about uh, uh, your own book, saying uh, that uh, there there is the point of view of a, of a Jew, but a Jew who is at the same time from Israel, I mean, Israelian, um, a Jew who uh, spent a long time outside Israel, a Jew who has been a Catholic in his childhood, a polymorphic uh, approach. And then you said it's a mixed approach of a Jew who experienced the Shoah, but at the same time is somebody who 
et de, un regard en quelque sorte étranger. Now, foreign, foreign uh, uh, approach, a foreign point of view. I would like to focus on this, étranger, because this seems to me related to uh, your, your presentation. In other words, all those people were strangers, foreigners, but at the same time, uh, there was this sort of ambivalence because uh, double allegiance, let's say, to their original background, which implied a constraint, but which has been uh, reworked by them into a different context. And here, I mean, uh, I would like to take this word étranger, and uh, I would like to mention a passage from the introduction to the first volume of your book, Nazi Germany and the Jews. And you said that you chose a stable chronological span which uh, aimed to create, I quote, a sense of estrangement counteracting our tendency to domesticate that particular past and blunt its impact by means of seamless explanations and standardized renditions. So from étranger to estrangement. And then uh, uh, just, just a, a short quote from uh, the introduction to the second volume of your book, Nazi Germany and the Jews, and you said, this is really a striking passage, the goal of historical knowledge is to domesticate this belief, to explain it away. In this book, I wish to offer a thorough historical study of the extermination of the Jews of Europe without eliminating or domesticating this initial sense of disbelief. Now, three quotations, étranger and then uh, uh, estrangement against uh, domestication of the evidence, and again, domestication of the evidence as a target. Could you please comment on this? <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity that you didn't give me your comments before we meet here, because I mean, I may look but I learned it from you. strange from uh, my own texts, but uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I can just add to it. Mm. <laughs> that is add to it in the sense that for most of the, the exiled writers uh, we can mention, uh, those I mentioned and many, many others, of course, in that period, there is the political choice as adults, and there is the cultural dependency, but I could a uh, cultural tie to the past, to their, uh, not only to the country and the language, as Thomas Mann said when he came back to Germany in 49 for the first time, he said, I am an American citizen, but a German writer. Mm. And, uh, and language is my homeland. Mm. That was his explanation, of course, of continuing to write in German. But of course, what he didn't say is that he took over what I said before, mm. uh, all the, the heavy elements of that German culture with mm. him. Mm. Uh, and that went against, of course, his political choices. There is this ambivalence. But as far as I'm concerned, I, I was a child when uh, the first dislocation, this location came from Prague to Paris, and uh, French became, I forgot German, I forgot Czech, but I learned French very quickly, and French became, as you may hear some of you, uh, from my accent, became my basic language. But then I went to Israel a few years later and started speaking Hebrew naturally. Uh, and not that I forgot French, but that was my third dislocation, not that I felt it at the time, but strangely enough, I kept reading in French, although I, I could read in Hebrew, of course, novels and so on, 
also being in Israel in a new country and with all the ideas of that time, I speak of the late 40s and early 50s. So without sensing it, I was already, that was the second dislocation. And then of course, over the years after being in Sweden and so on, I moved to, to the States several times, but now more or less definitively. And, uh, and that was, and now I write in English, you see. So for me at least, there is exile within exile within exile. I have no language, which is my homeland. I have none. I was asked many times, in which language do you dream? Hey, I don't dream very much. But uh, <laughs> even if I did, which I wish, uh, I don't know in which language I would dream because I don't have a fixed language. I mean, when I had to speak in German a few uh, weeks ago, uh, kind of important speech, but as I never learned to read German, I had to practice that for, for quite a few weeks until the speech. And uh, I realized that my English and my French, I was losing words because I was reading in, uh, German all the time. So I have no language. So for me, exile, if the language is a homeland, I have no homeland. So to come to the end of this, the question is then, where is your identity? What you didn't ask, but that would be, what is the identity of an exiled person if he lost the language? Well, it is memory. And eventually, the memory of the Shoah. So I would say I am a Jew who was formed by the experience of the Holocaust, as they call it here, uh, without realizing it for many years. But more, as time was going by, my identity and therefore my homeland, if I may say, was in, in the past and in, in a tragic past. So there are many types of exile and sometimes you don't even have a homeland to to hold, but you have memory of something, whatever that may be. I wanted actually before you, I wanted to ask you when I thought of our evening, how much, because you mentioned the story you were told, which by the way could be a German story as horrible as it is. I mean, uh, I'm astonished that Italian stories can be as uh, as uh, extreme as that, but never mind. I, I, mean, I don't know, never mind, may not be good. I wanted to ask you how much your own exile in the south of Italy, internal exile, you were, you were younger and uh, you were a small kid, but still you were to the age of, well, the, the age of four. How much did it impact on because that wasn't clear for me in what you quoted on your, on your choices of topics. Maybe I will go back to this later because I, I, I'm tempted to um, ask you something more about uh, this domestication, which is related to historical knowledge. Because, uh, I mean, you focused on exile as a partial loss. Yeah. in terms of language. You don't have a homeland in terms of language. Yeah. But then uh, there is the advantage of exile, possibly, meaning distanciation. This because, is, uh, uh, because uh, I mean, after all, this idea of estrangement, uh, which is not necessarily related to exile, I'm thinking about uh, Viktor Shklovsky's essay on estrangement, on which I worked uh, many years ago. So the idea that I mean, it's a literary device which implies that you look or somebody looks at reality as something opaque. And this uh, um, lack of understanding paves the way to a deeper understanding. So it's a literary device which has been uh, embodied by uh, long centuries by Brazilian uh, um, 
savages in Montaigne's essay on carnivals, mm -hmm. by, uh, let's say, a horse, like in a splendid uh, uh, short tale by Tolstoy, by children, and so on and so forth. So the idea that, let's say, you make something strange in order to understand something deeper. Now, in the case of exile, you have a distance which is related to the ambivalence you were talking before. So this is, let's say, an advantage in terms of knowledge. And actually, you oppose that this is a quite shocking. Let's say the domestication of evidence or the domestication which is related to historical knowledge to a different kind of historical knowledge, which is the, uh, I mean, uh, the your, your own choice. In other words, uh, to avoid the idea that the extermination of the Jews in Europe is something which can be fully understood. Am I going too far? No. no. So let's say I was thinking about a proverb which we are both familiar with and we possibly both reject, but maybe not for the same reason, meaning, meaning to comprendre or say to pardon. Ah, oui. no. I detest <laughs> this, yeah. as you do, <laughs> yeah. but you are, on, on the other hand, you are opposing, let's say, historical knowledge as domestication to something which keeps, let's say, the opaqueness of that reality. And actually, in the introduction to your first, to the first volume of your, of your uh, book, you say that, that this kind of uh, estrangement is something which is similar to the victim's perception. I was not sure, I must say, because I think that uh, there is distance in your case as a historian, which is different from, uh, let's say, the victim's perception. But still, I think that, uh, let's say, this rejection of domestication is something which is crucial. And it seems to me that this is related to your perception related to the exile, it seems to me. Étranger, estrangement. Yes, but uh, uh, it's also related to my perception of the, of the experience that the subject uh, which we are alluding to, that is the extermination of the Jews, I noticed, as everybody does, that with time uh, something is disappearing. That is, the, to read between the lines of what is written in the documents, this is disappearing because we are in the generation of the grandchildren of that period. And so my, my feeling over the years, after having been for many years distanced from those events totally, mm -hmm. I mean, I never had told you that, but I simply didn't want to hear anything about it, and I didn't feel the need to, to approach the subject. So I approached it very slowly. It took me, let's say, 15, 20 years to approach it. But this having been realized what I was writing about, I understood what I was writing about, I suddenly realized that with time something was getting lost, mm. which cannot be expressed in the usual historical domestication uh, process. That is domestication in the sense of aplatir, mm -hmm. uh, make sense, flat, flatten the events and tell them in their uh, sequence or not, or even juxtaposing experiences. I mean, uh, just an example, if you have, if I think of a book on the, uh, on the extermination of the Jews of Holland, you have a chapter on the Germans and the whole German bureaucracy in Hague and Amsterdam and all over Holland. Then you have a chapter on the victims and then you have a chapter on, on Dutch society. So 
Yes, you juxtapose that you keep to the normal historical narration. I knew, of course, that all this was one, one set of events, integrated events, but to put them together, you had not to speak in a distance or from a distance about this ensemble. You had in you had to to sense in a way what was sensed at the time by those who were implicated, mainly the Jews, of course, because the Germans you can you, you have a lot of documents also on personal attitudes, but from the Jews it was a separated history. So I tried to put those things together, and this being put together created this opacity that you mention and that I consider as natural when you speak of extreme events. I mean, I, I can't imagine, even, even relating to, to the history of Italy under fascism, and mostly to the Salo Republic. Um, I can't imagine that this can be told without dealing with an interaction between the police of the Salo Republic, the Germans, and the Jews as one element of the story, that is. You cannot catch the, the experience, the anxiety, the pain, and the death of one part without at the same time seeing the decisions, the bureaucracy, the, the sadism of the other side, and then, of course, the Italian the brava gente or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So in order to, to catch that, you have to use an intuition which has little to do with the more abstract historical way of writing. Okay, very interesting. Now, which was your strategy? Your narrative strategy? Uh, by the way, we have been talking about historical narrative uh, for many years uh, at UCLA, and um, I mean, there was a, an event which you mentioned uh, in your autobiography, the second volume, when Hayden White came uh, and gave a lecture on campus. And so there was a debate which paved the way to the conference which you organized. I still remember our conversation after uh, Hayden White's uh, presentation. In any case, uh, I'm uh, mentioning this because here we are touching a, a very a crucial epistemological uh, topic, which I would describe as the cognitive implication of every narrative. We have to make choices, but uh, I mean, a, a different narratives have different uh, cognitive implications. Now, which was your choice, especially in the second volume, chronicle? I mean, the chronological order, which you mentioned. I mean, I, 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 I mentioned your comment in the introduction. That was not obvious at all. One could have said, but I mean, chronicle, I'm still, uh, I mean, uh, as it, being Italian, I'm uh, immediately think about uh, the uh, 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 opposition made by, put forward by Benedetto Croce in his uh, Teoria Historia della Storiografia between chronicles uh, and history. Now, you made a choice which was related to a chronological presentation which was not obvious. Actually, when you mentioned uh, a different alternative, you spoke about, uh, let's say, a sort of presentation focusing on different topics. But the Chronicle, in fact, in your book, is a kind of uh, rejection of domestication. The, let's say, the pace of Chronicle, the impersonality of uh, the chronological sequence, implies a kind of depaysement, an estrangement effect. Uh, I reread recently, uh, the second volume, I was deeply impressed by this. 
So I wonder whether before, let's say, writing the second volume, you have been considering different alternatives in terms of, in terms of narrative strategies. Yes, but I didn't know how to proceed. Mm. I mean, you see, the, the first volume of this history of the Shoah deals with a period from 33 to 39, to the beginning of the war, uh, where major events happened in one country, where the decisions are clearly in Berlin and the Jews of Germany uh, go along and try to leave at the very end uh, of the period. But in any case, the, the sequence of events be which become worse and worse, but still within the framework of peacetime, um, is easy to narrate because you have a unity of place and the unity of action, I would say, coming from Berlin and the passivity of the Jewish population or, uh, and, of course, uh, passivity or not of the German population. No. Now, once you enter the, the war period, situation changes totally. You have so X countries involved, not only European countries, but mainly, of course, where the action takes place. Then you have uh, the reactions in Palestine from the Jewish community. You have the reaction in this country of the United States, and so on and so forth. Switzerland, of course, neutral country, but very much involved over it. Uh, related to this, and so on. So how do you narrate this without creating a total chaos? The more so that in each country you have the local authorities and the Germans, the interaction between the local authorities and the Germans and the population, and so on, as that in, what, 20 countries in Europe. I didn't count it, but uh, how do you narrate all that with the sense of a growing opacity in what's happening, because at some moment you go from the understandable to the much less understandable. That is in 42, when the extermination starts all over the continent, not only on Soviet territory, not only in Poland, but all over. So you have X factors and an event or a series of events which, which are total challenges for, for the verstehen of the historian according to Dilthey. So then I had no choice but to choose a chronicle not in order to create the distance but in order to make the story understandable. Because if I go six months and six months, that is more or less the chronology of it from mm. September 39 to May 40, from mm. May 40 to September 40, and so on. It makes sense also in terms of the history of World War II. But all that, if you integrate all the elements, if you can tell them within a a short span of time, six months, six months, six months, six months, the reader can follow you. So you see, it was, it, it was a, a way of writing which didn't, cre which created estrangement at some moment because of the events themselves and the reaction of the victims who do not, they are the only ones who didn't understand what was going on did not understand what was going on. I gave an example very recently, uh, repeating a diary which some of you may know of Helen Baer, mm -hmm. a French Jewess, who in 1943, <coughs> uh, she worked in a hospital in Paris. She was the only, that was the only hospital, a Jewish hospital in Paris, in France actually. And she was, uh, she was actually a historian of literature, uh, but here she worked, 43. 
as a Jewess. And uh, she says, I don't understand. They just took 40 of my patients to send them to work in Italy. Most of them are practically dying. They will die on the train. What, work in Germany? What? Well, she didn't understand the obvious, that they took them in order to kill them. And not all the people. So you, you have this total un incapacity of the victims or their refusal to understand what's happening to them. And you are there writing about that and writing about the event, the event as such, 40 patients, one woman who is about to give birth, another somebody, somebody paralyzed in the face and so on, who are being taken to work in jail to be killed. All that is very hard to, to understand. And so you use this technique of telling that with the German decisions, with the reactions of the victims of Helen Baer, who died, of course, in Auschwitz a few months later. So uh, you don't know how to handle this. So I handled it in the small units where everything is told together. You may say it distances us from the events, which was an intention in any case, because to, to give the feeling at the end that something there is not completely clear. Also, it is clear by any uh, traditional historical interpretation. I mean, domesticated, clear, the Germans decided to choose, uh, went to their death, not knowing that they were going to their death, but some of them knew. Uh, and the others looked around. I had no choice but to choose this uh, strategy. You said, I had no choice in order to make this, this uh, uh, event understandable. In fact, you had choices, but you rejected them. And uh, the outcome is a narrative which points to something which is not understandable, fully understandable. So you can see how many ambiguities are related to this uh, phenomenon, which is obviously extreme. I mean, uh, it's incomparable with other events. But uh, in a way, you are touching a sort of uh, extreme border, which is related to, the, to historical knowledge. And actually, the passage I quoted before looked at historical knowledge in a sort of ambivalent way, as a target and as an instrument. This seems to me very important. And as a challenge. As a challenge, of course. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, we have been focusing on, uh, let's say, exile and creativity. Um, let's say, exile. Hello. I asked you a question, <laughs> which you didn't answer, okay. but I, I remember at least that, you know. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I mean... Uh, you thought I would forget. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, I was trying to evade, but uh, okay. <laughs> now, uh, I, as you said, I was a kid. I mean, uh, when I uh, left this village, and I have a vivid memory of uh, leaving that village uh, and going to Rome is one of my earliest uh, souvenirs. But uh, it was during the war. It was in uh, September uh, uh, 1943. And um, you returned so, to Rome in 43? I mean, after the collapse of the, of the fascist yeah. regime. So my father went to Rome, and my mother with the, the, the children reached him. So I still remember, I mean, uh, we went to Rome and, uh, I mean, uh, the, the train, uh, the, the, was a, uh, there were bombs and so on. I mean, it was really shocking. But um, so, I mean, I was, uh, I was four. So, I mean, um, uh, my memories uh, are, I wouldn't say the result of a retrospective uh, reworking because, um, um, no, this is not the case. And actually, I didn't uh, talk about my souvenir with my mother, in fact. 
but um, uh, the impact of, uh, for instance, uh, Crocetta's uh, stories, which I mentioned in my short presentation, is the result of a sort of a guesswork, because uh, I was trying to understand uh, why, when I was uh, 20 uh, in Pisa, at the Scuola Normale, I suddenly made a triple decision to try to become a historian, to work on uh, witchcraft, to try to catch, to rescue the voices and attitudes of the victims. Now, uh, behind the idea of uh, the attempt to become an historian, there was Marc Bloch. Um, so the, not only the historian's craft, but uh, even more so, uh, Le Roi Tomaturge, uh, the royal touch, a book which uh, touched me deeply. Uh, I thought, well, if it's possible to write a book like this, uh, history, uh, I mean, as, a, as, a, as an intellectual enterprise, uh, is really something extremely rich and rewarding. So uh, I, uh, there was this, but then for some reason, and uh, this was really, I mean, uh, something which retrospectively I thought incredible, I did not connect mm -hmm. the idea of uh, working of the victims, which was a sort of paradoxical enterprise because uh, it was uh, the idea of reading between the lines uh, the witchcraft trials using the archives of repression in order to rescue the voices of the victims, which implied a lot of methodological problems. Um, but I was completely unaware of this. But uh, I did not connect uh, this uh, project with my own experience as a, as a child. I actually, some time ago, at the, a couple of, of years ago, I, was, um, I had a public dialogue at the New York Public Library with my friend Paul Oldengraber, who did not succeed to come here. He was in India and uh, was unable to come here. But, uh, there was a series about uh, Jewishness, and I sent a title which was uh, Being Jewish, Becoming Jewish. This was the topic of our conversation. And uh, I became a Jew during the war, and I have a vivid memory of this, because uh, we were on the front line uh, near Florence. I still remember, I mean, uh, the Germans, and then the Germans leaving, but, uh, and the English troops arriving, but uh, we were there, my mother, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, and myself um, under a false name, and, um, but I didn't know that. And my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who was the only uh, non-Jewish member in my family, she told me, if somebody will ask you, what's your name? You should answer, my name is Carlo Tanzi. Actually, this was uh, her father's name, but he, I didn't know that. And uh, she wrote Carlo Tanzi on the front page of a book I was uh, being read at that moment, Il bambino più felice del mondo, the most, uh, the happiest uh, child in the world. And um, I still have a vivid memory of my grandmother's handwriting, uh, writing Carlo Tanzi and uh, retrospectively, I think that at that moment I became a Jew. Uh, in other words, uh, I mean, uh, certainly it's the persecution which made me uh, a Jew, although, I mean, I was Jewish on both sides of my family, except for my maternal grandmother. So the connection between, uh, let's say, that experience and, uh, let's say, trying to rescue the voices and attitudes of the victims of witchcraft trials was obvious, but uh, I didn't think about that. And for years, I still remember the moment in which there was this kind of paradoxical revelation. I was in Torino, in front of the Einaudi Publishing House. Actually, the publishing house was uh, founded, as I mentioned, uh, by my father and Julia Einaudi. 
And uh, so I had a conversation with uh, an art historian, Paolo Fossati, and he told me I'd already published not only my first book, The Knife Battles, but also uh, the book which was mentioned, uh, The Cheese and the Worms, which also deals with uh, Inquisition trials. And uh, Paolo Fossati told me, well, I mean, you are Jewish, so it's obvious that you deal with uh, witches, heretics, and I thought, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it, it's incredible why I didn't think about this. <laughs> and I think that, I mean, as a sort of post-Freudian reader of Freud, that, let's say, there was a sort of unconscious strategy concealing this obvious connection in order to make this connection working more deeply. So, I mean, uh, there was this um, emotional contiguity with uh, the victims, and later, much later, I discovered that there was also an intellectual contiguity with the inquisitors, and I was really troubled by this. I published an article which was, uh, the title was uh, The Inquisitor as Anthropologist. Now, years later, I was in Moscow for a, I mean, I gave some lectures, and I received a phone call. And uh, somebody on the phone said, uh, we are from Memorial. I mean, I heard about this institution. They were f uh, fighting, I mean, uh, the, during the Chechnya war, they were fighting for uh, human rights and so on. And they were especially involved in the um, history of the, of the um, uh, um, Stalinist, um, persecution, uh, collecting names of victims and so on. And um, so they said, uh, would you like to come to our place to have a public conversation? And they said, well, I was, I couldn't understand why. I was flattered, but uh, in incredulous. And they said, but why? And the voice said, but uh, we have been interested in your uh, essay, The Inquisitor as Anthropologist. So we had a conversation and uh, their point was that maybe it would be possible to use your oblique strategy in order to work on uh, political on trials during the Stalin uh, era, which was a completely unexpected reading of my essay. But um, after all, this is not the exception, it's the norm. I mean, uh, what we write can be reworked in so many different directions. So, let's say uh, there was this, but then there was also, I suspect, uh, uh, there were also memories of uh, those fairy tales. Yeah. I have a vivid memory of a, uh, a book by the uh, Italian uh, late 19th century Sicilian writer Luigi Capuana. He collected, uh, I mean, he rewrote um, <coughs> fairy tales and it was a splendid uh, story about uh, a, a girl entering a castle, and there was only one inhabitant, Gomitetto. And it was the illustration, I think, by Carlo Chiostri, beautiful, beautiful illustrations. So there was this uh, little uh, human being with a turban and a huge feather. And then, after a while, he turned it into a werewolf, into a wolf. So I was, I remember I was, uh, let's say, leafing the book, looking at Comitetto, and then on the next page there was the wolf assaulting the girl. And I still remember that I was much more troubled by the first image, by Comitetto, than by the wolf. I've been dealing with werewolves um, uh, for years. <coughs> Actually, there is a book. Uh, on a werewolf case, which is going to be published by Chicago University Press, written by Bruce Lincoln and myself. Um, Bruce Lincoln, a uh, well-known, uh, highly uh, uh, remarkable uh, historian of religions, approached the same case I've been dealing with in a different perspective. So we have been uh, debating about this, and the book will include uh, our essays and the final conversation, final debate, 
So I've been, uh, let's say, one could say, obsessed by werewolves, <laughs> and also by those that kind of uh, macabre uh, uh, stories I heard from Crocetta. No. This encounter with Crocetta was really moving, but uh, it's no. different. So that's, no, this was my that, long uh, answer to your question. <laughs> the libro, uh, the book which is uh, the forthcoming book, Old Tease, is the character. It was a, I mean, uh, there was a trial. I mean, I did not discover the trial. The trial actually was uh, dealt with by a um, historian, uh, a Baltic historian, and then reworked in a completely different perspective by a Nazi-oriented uh, Viennese historian of religions, Otto Höfler. And uh, so through Höfler, I discovered the trial. Then I went back to the original uh, proceedings, which were published in German. Um, and then, uh, uh, so I approached this trial. It's a late 17th century trial. And this man, an old man, there were no, uh, torture was not, no longer used in uh, trials against werewolves. And he said, uh, well, people, because uh, the judge said, uh, so you have been accused of being a werewolf. And he said, yes, I'm a werewolf. With other werewolves, we uh, fight against, against witches for the fertility of the crops. Now, I've been working in Friuli, and I discovered that uh, on Inquisition trials, I discovered uh, more than 50, some, some of them very long trials, against Benandanti, people who said that having, being born, being born in, a, uh, in, a, in the amniotic sac, in, con la camicia, as they say in Italian, they fought in spirit three times or four times a year against the witches for the fertility of the crops. So in my book, I, was, I included a passage saying uh, there is this perplexing uh, uh, parallel, which was, uh, I was unable to, to, to explain, between the ben Friuli and Benandanti and the, uh, the case of the old teas. And then I discovered that, in fact, uh, according, I mean, uh, in the uh, Russian folklore, people born in, uh, in, uh, in a coal, in the amniotic sac, <coughs> are believed to become werewolves. <laughs> and then, I, years later, I rewrote, in a, so to speak, Freud's case about the wolfman. Because uh, in the case of the wolfman, Freud recorded a detail, but without interpreting it. He simply recorded it. The patient, a Russian, said, that he was born in a coal. Mm. And then, uh, I mean, uh, he was exposed to the, that was my interpretation of using Freud's uh, evidence, that he was uh, exposed to the tales of the, uh, fairy tales of the, of the Nyanya, and he had this vision, of this dream, actually a dream, about <coughs> five wolves looking at him from a tree. So in any case, I tried, I, let's say, attempted to rewrite Freud's case from a different perspective, starting from that detail. But, uh, okay, here, I mean, uh, I mean, it's a bit far from our topic. <laughs> 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 yeah. Someone of you have questions? I would like to ask something. Uh, exile is certainly a, a tragedy, uh, it's certainly a loss you know, of a country, of a language, of a loving people, uh, but could be also an occasion, a, sh a, ch a chance to, to, to get something more, to uh, for a person who leave and, and, and go in another 
completely different situation. Could be also an occasion to grow or not. Well, I mean, we have been focusing on this, but uh, I'm tempted to focus on the opposite side. In other words, uh, exile is a tragedy. Actually, I mean, I read recently an essay by Edward Said. I must say I read uh, Orientalism a long time ago, and I was not particularly, uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I, I had perplexities. I thought it was uh, too simplistic, and the chronology was debatable. So I was not uh, particularly happy with that book. But there is an essay by Said, Reflections on Exile, which seems to me extremely interesting and uh, actually challenging, especially about, uh, let's say, the connection between exile and nationalism, which is something which works both in the case of, uh, I mean, uh, Jews and Palestinians, but you may expand this, for instance, to Italian Risorgimento. So, I mean, uh, Think about uh, Mazzini, Garibaldi, so let's say the construction of national identity being based on the experience of exiles. And uh, so this would be a sort of enrichment of the topic. Um, so we may go on, but I will stop. Uh, about, yeah, I, you know, I don't want to, to um, banalize this, you know, all this thing about the exiles, the, the Jews, and I mean, this tragic, uh, tragic uh, events of history. But as someone who has uh, vaguely worked on Dante and written on him, I mean, he's the most famous exile in Italian history. But tonight, I never thought in this, in this way. Uh, yeah, I thought, uh, of course, when he says, quantus ha di sale, lo pane altrui. Yes, of course, he remembers Tuscany where the bread is not salted. Uh, but I never really thought that for Dante, hearing this Venetian dialect all the time must have been very hard, very, very hard. So he threw himself into this excessive Florentinity, in a way, yeah, of language, of language because he uses really, I mean, he really sounds to me, I am from Milan, so it sounds, sounds to me really, really hyper-Florentine. And then, of course, he feels free to, to do what he does to his Florentine <laughs> um, companions, but also free to, to do something which is really revolutionary. I mean, like, he, he, he takes the Bible in his hands and he um, <laughs> undoes it. And, and, and the second reflection, and, and uh, I apologize, you know, this is, and I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, um, it's about my experience as someone who has lived in this country for so many years without wanting to become American and uh, in, in living this in a kind of exile. Uh, although it was a chance exile and I don't blame anyone and, and, and so on and so forth. I have my own personal history. But, uh, but the fact is that, yes, I felt free. Of course, I wrote in Italian in, in here Tirando mi la zappa sui piedi. I don't know how you say that in, in English, but every Italian here understands. Um, I wrote in Italian, and I know that I would never have written the things that I have written in Italian if I had written them in Italy. <laughs> I, I know, I know for sure. Um, it, anyway, that I'm. Well, thank you, thank you for, for your comment, but let me say just a couple of words about Dante, because I think that with Dante, we, we have this, but we have also a deep ambivalence about, first of all, about Florence, be deep ambivalence. And then uh, the idea that, let's say, the polyphony, I mean, the, the variety of languages, including invented languages, Pape Satan, Pape Satan Aleppe. So this is really at the very heart of his project. So Florentine, but, and so uh, it's a Latin and uh, Provencal and then, uh, yeah, and so on and so forth. So I think that we are back in a sense to the ambivalence we started from, because it seems to me that, let's say, ambivalence is in fact a trait which is at the very heart of the experience of exile. It's impossible to abolish it. This was my feeling in, in listening to you. Uh, 
Uh, Professor Ginsburg, you alluded to uh, Professor Friedlander having spent time as a Catholic in a Catholic school in France. Uh, your mother also became a Catholic, is that right? Did you, were you brought up in that context or? Uh, I was never exposed to Catholic religion. I mean, um, we never talked about that. Actually, I mean, uh, she, um, she uh, felt herself uh, as a Catholic uh, after the war. Uh, she was very close to Felice Balbo, whom I met. And uh, I mean, uh, it was uh, extremely influential on my own uh, trajectory. But uh, we never spoke about that. And um, so, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I attended classes in Italian schools about, uh, let's say, religion, but uh, I was never exposed to any kind of uh, Catholic. Uh, Do you think that for her was a sort of exile? Which one? Beco be becoming Catholic. No, I wouldn't say so. I mean, uh, actually, recently, I came across a, a text, a, a previously unpublished text by Rocco Scotellaro, the Italian poet uh, who was a socialist mayor in a small village. And he met my mother in uh, 1946. And to my surprise, he recorded in, a, in his diary, she says that she's Catholic and communist. And this was, uh, let's say, Balbo's attitude. It was a, a little party. Uh, and she was already a, a member of the, of the Communist Party, but she felt herself uh, as a Catholic. But this was, was absolutely absent from my, not only from my education, but also from my interaction with her. Yeah. Uh, thank you both. A very moving conversation. I want to ask each of you, um, how exile has manifested intergenerationally for you. I don't know if you have children, um, but if you do, or nieces or nephews, however it's played out for you, I'm curious, how do you relate this experience of exile that's so uniquely your own that future generations haven't experienced, but that, how do you want them to relate to it? And how do you talk, how have you talked to them about that experience? Thank you. I cannot really answer for them. My, my son is in the public, so theoretically he could answer. <laughs> but I won't submit him to, uh, uh, to this challenge. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I really don't know because I never... Well, I know that Ellie uh, did read the, the memoir which I wrote in 78 on Cambian Souvenir. Um, and uh, I'm sure that the other kids read it as well, my second son and my daughter. But I never tried to ask them how they feel about the events and about the family aspect of it. Because I probably didn't want to know how deeply this went or not. I would prefer not to tell you the truth because there is a, a whole literature about the reactions of the second generation which has been partly, um, I have the feeling this transmission of anxiety goes into the second generation, maybe even into the third. So I, I prefer not, not to touch on the subject too much. If I'm asked, of course, I will answer, but not uh, if, uh, if I have to take the initiative, I prefer not to. Thank you very much for both of you. Um, I don't know if I understood you Correctly. I don't know if I understood you correctly, Professor Friedlander, but when you said you didn't find identity in, in any of the languages that are your languages, I think you said that you found identity in memory. 
what memory of what? <laughs> That's a good question, of course. Uh, so not of my names, because I changed names five times, I think. Um, not of my languages, because I'm not really, as I said, I write in English for all the volumes that uh, Carlo mentioned, except the early memoir were written, written in French then and now in English. The memory of what I, it took me a long time to come to that identity. Strangely enough, it took years to come to know who, who I am. I was writing already about the Pope Pius XII and other books which are related, of course, to the Shoah, to the Holocaust. But I didn't really find my own voice, if I may say, until I wrote those two volumes, the history. Uh, and this came after a series of shocks, uh, which I, I had experienced in Germany a, f a few years beforehand, discussions which were highly unpleasant. So I guess that uh, the shocks in a way brought me to the decision, this is where I am, as Luther said, and I can't any other way, and I will write this. And I understood also by doing that, that this was, uh, this was my identity. This was where I really was rooted. And it, so the important thing in answering you is it took a lot of time, but that's the homeland. If I, paradoxically, of course, the homeland in a place which is no place, really. I'm, I'm from Italy. Uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, uh, the ambiguity of identities. And uh, I'd like to know your uh, thoughts about what I think it's uh, are really uh, interesting and tragic experience in Italy now for Italians and not Italians in Italy, the immigration. And I think Italy is struggling for uh, a new identity. So I'd like to, to hear something about it. Well, uh, I must say, um, I, I mean, uh, I never use the word identity as an analytic category. I think it's a political weapon. And uh, actually, I reflected on identity years ago, uh, starting from a question I addressed to myself. Why am I ashamed of Berlusconi? <laughs> it was not obvious. It was not obvious to me. It was not obvious to me. Because, uh, uh, and then reflecting on this, I realized that my, uh, let's say, definition of uh, what is your country is the country which you may be ashamed of. Because shame is something very private and, and deep. So I was teaching here, and for instance, I at UCLA, sorry, well, in this country, I was not ashamed of Guantanamo. Not ashamed. I was, I mean, it was you horrible. You didn't care. No, 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 no. Um, there is a difference between uh, d d d d do, do not care and uh, be ashamed of. Actually, starting from this um, uh, question, which I addressed to myself, I provided in a short essay on shame, in which I tried to reconstruct the kind of genealogy of shame, of the notion of shame, starting from uh, Homer Iliad, but in any case. It, was, uh, it came out in German, but in any case. Um, uh, the idea was to provide a definition of identity, which identity as the point of intersection of different sets, uh, sets uh, in a sort of mathematical sense. So for instance, I am a member of the animal species Homo sapiens sapiens. I am a member of the uh, masculine moiety. I'm a member of a set 
uh, of retired uh, university professors born in Torino, and so on and so forth. <laughs> and then uh, there is a set in which there is only one member, my fingerprints. Now, to identify identity with uh, uh, one's fingerprints makes sense in certain contexts, but otherwise, from, a, a, from the point of view of a historian, we have to work on the interaction between something which is generic, more or less generic, and something which is more or less individual, and something which is unique. And I think this is much more challenging than the usual notion of identity. So in that sense, that's the reason why I, saw, I reacted immediately to the ambivalence which emerged from your presentation. Because I would say that this ambivalence is certainly a special case. You may make a set including German uh, writers in exile and so on and so forth. But uh, the lack of uniqueness is shared by everybody, I would say. That's the reason why I don't use the word identity as an analytic category. So when somebody, a minister, a pope, or whatever, uh, speaks about uh, European identity, Italian identity, Jewish identity, I reject this notion completely. There is not such thing. But certainly, as historians, we deal with people talking about identity. But that's something different. If I may, so from where are you talking when you write about the witches? Uh... Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is this sort of intersection uh, in which uh, there are, let's say, uh, a member of this piece is homo sapiens and so on and so forth including my fingerprints, including the fact that uh, I was Jewish, I became also Jewish, and so on and so forth. But I mean, I share this identity with, for instance, everybody in this room being member, if you may say so, of the same animal species, and so on and so forth. And then there are, let's say, males and females, and so on and so forth. But I mean, I reject the idea that identity is something which implies a definite trait. We are close to Wittgenstein's notion of family resemblances based on uh, Francis Galton's uh, images, but uh, this would lead me to something different. So let's stop here. Okay, I think that we...